Uh, hello, hello everybody. Can everyone hear me fine if I talk on this level? Yeah. Yes, great. Is everyone able to see more or less what's on the screen? Yes, yes. okay, okay, okay. Uh, I told uh, Bosch, 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 Boots. <laughs> okay, I didn't get that one the first time, sorry. Uh, that I would introduce myself. Uh, I had prepared it a little bit, so I will. Uh, do that, um, and then I'll also introduce a lecture. Uh, you already know a bit who you are, so I didn't want to spend 10 minutes like saying everyone's names, etc. I uh, see you, and uh, I will ask also of, uh, for your uh, inputs in a way. So if you feel like uh, sharing anything or uh, contesting any of the ideas that I propose or if you want if you feel triggered to share oh I saw this and I would like to comment on that please feel free to do that at any time that's why I call this a conversation uh, I've prepared enough material to last two hours and a half uh, I don't need to talk about everything that I brought so if we get stuck on something because it's interesting and we get into a conversation together that would only make this event richer uh, and then I can also hear some of your names uh, if that's the case. Okay, so please feel free uh, to do that. Um, okay, another uh, thing before I start. I put a lot of information on my presentations. I do that uh, a lot, uh, but that's not for you to take in now, you know. Take notes if you want to, but I will share this with uh, Laura and she will share it with you and then you can also open the links in your own uh, time and leisure. And maybe, you know, you get stuck with one idea and you lose me for 15 minutes. That's also okay. And you can come back to that uh, later. Okay? Uh, yeah. This year I had a student who had narcolepsy and he fell asleep for three quarters of my uh, course every time. And it was very interesting because he was really eager and willing to be uh, with us and then it was like no worries because you know this is there and he would look at it in his own time and then come back to me with questions you know so everything's uh, everything's allowed <laughs> um, okay this is how we chose to name okay this is starting really well okay there uh, this is how we sh chose to uh, uh, title this shared questions by contemporary dance makers today a conversation that's a very short sentence. Um, I want to start with introducing myself uh, so that I can also talk a, li a little bit about my positionality. I need to do that in a way. Hello, welcome everybody. Hello, nice to have you. Uh, so I'll do that uh, in a couple of minutes. This is me. No, that's not me. That's, uh, that's the love of my life. That is Sam, my dog. Uh, and here he is. Oh, good. There, yeah. And there I am with the other love of my life, my partner Alfonso and Sam doing the croqueta uh, <laughs> on the floor. Uh, I live, we live together in uh, Amsterdam. I also was born in the Netherlands, but I actually grew up in a small village in Catalonia uh, called Banyolas. Uh, there is where I uh, grew up in the countryside next to a lake. I used to row when I was little, Olympic rowing, actually. Uh, Spanish champion in 2001. <laughs> uh, and then I moved to Barcelona where I lived for 10 years, where I studied. I studied journalism and I studied uh, choreography and dance interpretation techniques in the Institut del Teatro. Uh, when I was uh, already uh, a bit older. And through those experiences, I found my uh, place within the, uh, yeah, within the dance field, within the performing arts field, uh, not only as someone who has uh, performed uh, since I was 14 as an actor as, uh, in my village, uh, very much in the amateur field, also as a dancer uh, in uh, Catalan traditional dances of all places, that's where I started and then also ballet, contemporary classes, etc. But in my studies in choreography, I found myself to be really interested in the act of 
reflecting upon, writing upon, talking upon, about uh, dance and the relationships, worlds, stories, uh, facts, presences that it uh, can touch, that it can bring together, that it, that it can uh, relate to. And that's a bit what I will do today. That's also what I do for a living. I am a teacher nowadays in the Netherlands in dance history and dance theory. And this is where also the, play, the thing of positionality comes in. I'm uh, growingly aware of my position as a uh, white cis male uh, who has learned in a certain tradition of things. And as a teacher, I try to uh, yeah, get in touch or uh, look at, learn from different perspectives than only the one that I have been in touch with in my upbringing. Uh, and that's an ongoing process uh, from which I learn every day. And maybe today is also for me an opportunity to learn from you. As much as I will give information, maybe I can also receive input and uh, other perspectives uh, of your own. Um, <clears throat> As I said, yes, I have also performed. This is one of the last uh, performances I did. And I also uh, have uh, made work uh, as a choreographer, uh, although now that's not my first or foremost um, activity. Poon, that's it. OK. Was that a l very long? Was that OK? Everyone still with me? Yes. OK. Um, <clears throat> I feel this is a bit um, awkward because I'm turning my back a lot to you. I don't like that, so I'm changing the set a bit. Yeah? OK, there we are. OK, now for today, as I said, this was about, we were talking with uh, Walter when we thought about this lecture, presentation, conversation. It was about this idea of the shared questions. Well, I am not here to uh, present you with any given truths or any uh, knowledge or science or uh, definitive uh, statement about the context that I know of. That's uh, impossible. That's not who I am. That's not how I uh, want to see myself. Also, as a writer or a teacher, you are always in this position of being in front of a group. And it seems that you have this kind of authority that you can state things. And that's not really what I'm intending to do. This is much more my reflections upon what I have seen in the last uh, days. But it is just a possibility. Uh, uh, there are many others. This is just a partial selection of things that I've seen and that I have knotted or knitted together, that I have connected through my own experience and my own perspectives. Uh, but there are many other possibilities within. In the questions that I will present, therefore, uh, you will, uh, you know, the works that I might talk about, they resonate within each other. And that's also a nice thing, I think, that perspectives, ways of working, metaphors, ideas, one a choreographer works with them uh, from a very uh, individual or biographic perspective. The research is done within or to the self or has a very strong connection with the in, uh, identity of the person. And then from there, it connects with uh, a broader sense of other people or communities, etc. Others do it the other way around. But they are working in a way with the same uh, thing or the same objective. Uh, so just. Again, as a, still on the introduction level, 10 minutes later. Uh, <laughs> let's keep this for the whole uh, lecture, that there is no thing that is fixed. This idea of the knots, of uh, strings that are being connected loosely with each other all the time, and that allow for other connections that maybe I will not speak about, but that can exist, or that you can feel, or that you can make in your own minds or with your own uh, experiences and shows that you have seen everything becomes a maze amongst contexts, amongst people, amongst choreographers, amongst poetic strategies. Uh, yeah, so I hope that you can receive what I uh, tell you as such. My geese, I did present a lot of introductions and disclaimers, I feel. But we are finally getting somewhere. <laughs> 
if this allows me. Kim, yes, I hear you nodding. OK, I'm going to do it this way. A first thought. <laughs> Uh, this is for you to check upon uh, later. Uh, there's this very interesting uh, documentary uh, on and with Donna Haraway. I don't know if, you, if someone has uh, seen it, maybe. Uh, storytelling for Earthly Survival. I see Alex nodding. Someone else maybe has heard of it or worked with it. It's just something that I um, give you as a, an inspiring piece of work for you to look at. Uh, in the future. I found it very inspiring to look at it also from the perspective of uh, dance making, uh, of dance making as world making, as storytelling. Uh, not only or not so much in the sense of telling a story narratively from A to Z, but more in the sense of being aware of the stories that are everywhere, in every place, and how we uh, use the body and dance as a means to, um, yeah, to make those stories present, to change them, to, um, yeah, to find new perspectives upon a certain idea, etc., etc. And the way that Donna Haraway talks about storytelling, uh, to me, it opens up many doors for future reflection. So I'm giving you that as a something that maybe you can also look in your own timing. Um, and actually, the questions that I will address today all speak a little bit about uh, dance as storytelling. Again, not necessarily as something that you show on stage with, oh, these are the characters, this is the story, but a way of relating to stories, to representation of something, to uh, yes, metaphors, or no, uh, history that is inside a place uh, or that is already in a body or that is already in me as, an, as a subject or in us as a collective. This awareness of the relations and the uh, strings that connect us all uh, are all very present in the works that I will uh, talk about today. The first question or shared topic that I uh, prepared for today was imagining alternative futures and or ways of being together through the creative act or through uh, stage performance. Now, I will just mention names and show some videos of projects and talk a little bit about them. Uh, and again, if you feel like, oh, this I know and I had a different experience, for example, or I have seen a piece that tries to do the same in a different way, uh, interrupt me at any time. Uh, it would be great to engage in that conversation. Oh. The first uh, maker that I would like to talk about is Cherish Menzo. Uh, I will show a small video, a teaser of her last uh, work, which is called Dark Matter. Laura, we didn't check the volume, but I don't know if we can, Laura? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is there a way to check the, mo the volume of the thing? Well, in this case, it's not uh, essential. Um, it's not intelligible, but I will just discuss a little bit uh, what this piece is. Uh, Cherish Menzo, she works uh, with the production house Grip in uh, Belgium, uh, but she is uh, originally Dutch. And she presented this work this year called Dark Matter in it, together with Camilo uh, uh, Mejia Cortez. Um, they combined spoken word uh, texts that they had written themselves, uh, coached by other spoken word uh, artists. They delved into the stories of uh, black peoples who had... Uh, oh, great. I can uh, try, yes. 
why am I not connected now? Bluetooth. Wonderboom? No. I think you pressed that control bar, no? The Bluetooth. Was it on? GBL charge? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. Um, I chose this uh, work because, as I said, the, sh the, uh, the, the topic, the broader topic, was this imagining alternative futures. Uh, Cherish Menzo, in this performance, she takes a lot of references. Uh, she works with ideas, uh, or uh, one of the references was a radio program from Detroit in the 70s. Uh, another, uh, uh, another reference, as I said, was this uh, uh, underwater world uh, uh, where the histories of a lot of black bodies have been forgotten. And this idea of that, hey, the, the text that they speak about are very much about bodies under the water and how to bring that heritage back onto the surface, but also very much with an Afrofuturistic uh, idea of this looking forward of how do, can, uh, can this body be uh, uh, tomorrow in the public space, uh, getting rid of uh, certain prejudices. And she does so in a way that is uh, choreographically, uh, yeah, not, not as a statement or not as a, again as a story that is told from A to Z, but using the body and their body and the color black that is played with in different uh, ways, with liquid pouring on the stage, with the black that you saw that paints their body. So with all the references that are symbolic, that are metaphoric, that are telling us something. She just presents a kind of image from another world, from a possible uh, alternative place that is still underground, uh, but that uh, connects with the audience in a way that is just uh, fighting in that dark matter to look forward, to find an opening, to but without resolving in any way, but using the poetics of bodies, of uh, metaphors, of symbols, uh, in this very choreographic way. You know? And this, for me, relates to something that is generally or, uh, a thing that dance has in its relationship to meaning. Yeah? The, the, the actual particularity of dance, of bodies moving, of movement, is that it does not relate to meaning necessarily in a way that is understandable. No? This is a gesture that everyone can uh, understand. But when I move, the relationship with meaning of this body becomes uh, uh, potentially anything. And uh, so it's not about uh, stating anything, but always looking at possibilities, at relations, at connections. <laughs> through somatics, through physical connection, and also through uh, uh, yeah, to how to unravel that. Yeah? So what I do, how you receive it with your history, with your background, et cetera, et cetera. There's always this shared agency when it comes to meaning. And that's something that Cherry Menzo utilizes or explores in a beautiful uh, manner in my way, in my, uh, from my perspective. Are there any questions? Am I, am I saying things that make sense to you in a way? Screening the room also in the back, yeah. Yep, yep, okay. Another example of this imagining futures, imagining new ways of being together, all these projects also speak of a certain kind of urgency that I experience in a lot of works. Uh, related to uh, diversity, related to how to 
how to live in a more inclusive uh, society, equal society also, uh, but also related to climate change. Uh, how do we envision new uh, futures and ways of being together, not only amongst people, but also with the world around us? That is something that I find very interesting in this work by Marina Mascarell. I don't know if that's a name that uh, rings a bell. She's a, uh, a choreographer from uh, Valencia, actually, in Spain. Uh, but she works in the Netherlands, uh, in Den Haag. Uh, and her last project is called Ortopedia Corporatio. And I will just show a fragment of it. Well, while we wait for it to connect, you saw a little bit the idea that these are nothing more than uh, teasers in the end. But what, uh, what did you see? What, uh, what stood out for you? If you think uh, a first... Uh, The color yellow. And body material that was restricted mm -hmm. by, let's say, plastic elements or devices that, yes. that are somehow like extensions of your species. Yes. These, uh, and these objects, uh, did you get to, uh, I mean, it was just 30 seconds, but did you get to see what these objects were? Tube. Like tubes, like plastic tubes, mm -hmm. uh, things that we know from. Uh, uh, works on the roads, uh, for example. Uh, oh, yeah, there was something uh, hanging from a rope, exactly, yes. Come again, sorry? Of circularity, yes, there was, no, they were uh, all moving actually in a bit of a circle. That's also something that's uh, reinforced, but something that was not visible, that's that the audience is seated in the four. Uh, sides of the place. It's something that happens in a specific, in specific places, so not really in a theater setting, or yes, in a theater setting, but on, on the stage. Hmm. I don't know if I can have technical assistance of somebody. Um, Let me try just one more time. <laughs> OK. Anyway, it gives us a little bit an idea. Uh, let's bring this back, OK? We were talking about projects that try to imagine alternative futures, that use dance to do so with this uh, kind of, uh, not vague, but uh, this relationship with a meaning that is always relative. Yeah, I know. Sorry, too late. In the case of Marina Mascarell, what she did in this project was she took def, uh, dancers, first of all, uh, really looking for different bodies with different ages, 
different histories uh, and different heritages, and she brought them together. And uh, they had different uh, residences in different places. They found objects from the streets around them. And with those objects also, uh, they took them as material to work with. And it was always with this idea to find, she literally says that uh, in uh, the description of the work, uh, this a community made of singular uh, misfits who have transcended individuality to become a social kaleidoscope. So the stage actually and those people in it as a zero place from where to meet for the first time and see what can we uh, do together with how can we be together if there's nothing else, in a way. Um, so in a way to imagine or explore other worlds with their, without forgetting their singular poetics and approach, but uh, with this idea of the found objects around them as a means to const construct a new world. It has also something of a sustainability in it, because it's not I'm building a uh, Scenography, but I'm using what I have around it and I multiply it. Uh, they use uh, thousands of, um, you know, the, the cola flashes that you have the, the pops, the dops, the um, things from a cola flesh. You know what I'm meaning? Yes, everyone with me? Yes, great. They have like thousands of those in a tube. They use, uh, Marina uses a lot of carton board. And there's a floor of carton that changes during the piece. So it also helps this feeling of a new world becoming through their actions and through their relations with those objects. There are microphones recording the sounds that they are making during the performance. And those sounds become the soundscape of the piece. So again, reinforcing even more this idea of a world becoming in front of our eyes through their movement and their physical relationship with those objects. So it's all about this. Uh, there's also a bit of hope in this act, in this act of worlding, of making a new world together, connecting together in that action. And having the audience at foresight also invites us into that moment uh, with those sounds being part of it. Uh, certainly, it, uh, you, know, it, uh, you become drawn into it thanks to her setup, thanks to the device of the setup. In both these cases, we are talking, both in Cherish's case and this case, we are still talking about projects that fall very much under the conventional kind of uh, stage work. Yeah? They build up a metaphor. It's something for us to look at. And these are choices of the choreographers to present that to us, audiences still there uh, to look at it as I don't believe in the idea of a passive spectator. That's something for another day. But yeah, to connect with it from that position that is very conventional in the way that we in the West understand uh, theater uh, practice or staged practice. Okay? There are other projects, though, that also <coughs> want to imagine new ways of uh, being together. Uh, I will now step over Nicole Beudler. You can look at the videos later. But she is also a choreographer in the Netherlands who also, in this also still very conventional world, but uh, using symbols, metaphors, references, builds up universes, asking questions about possible outcomes. In her last works, one was metaphor. She did that with masculinity, or uh, yeah, the idea of het het heteropatriarchy uh, and manliness, in a way, uh, how to look beyond the static or conventional way of looking at what masculinity is to invent a new kind of masculinity. And in her latest work, she's really reflecting a lot about uh, climate change, how to deal with the uh, mess that we're making, et cetera, et cetera. But also, again, from this very conventional, uh, metaphoric even, uh, very representational in the most conventional way of things, et cetera. Another way that I would like to talk about, or an initiative, or a way of uh, relating to uh, other uh, ways of alternative ways of being together or imagining other futures. I want to talk about through a project from a collective called Nyam Nyam 
in uh, my local context in Catalonia. Uh, Kim knows them uh, well, I think. Um, <clears throat> in their last uh, project, which is called INERT, they try to really think uh, beyond anthropocentrism. This is another shared question that is alive nowadays in uh, current debates of how do we take ourselves as humankind, as a species, out of the center of our way of thinking, really as a philosophical uh, position that takes us away from the center of the universe and puts us on a more similar level to other entities in this world. No? This idea of overcoming anthropocentrism is also a debate that is alive in philosophy, anthropology, sociology, uh, biology, etc., etc. Now, in their later, uh, in this later project that's called Inert, they go out from this idea of transcorporality, which is also a, uh, a a big word or a word that can that we can wonder what does it mean. In and they interpret it or they fill it in with this idea of we uh, put our bodies at the same level as this body that is here and that also carries a story and that carries a story that is evenly powerful and poetically telling as my own or that of my body, of my subjective experience, etc. And in this project, INERT, they start by going to a place. This has also, uh, they start by going to a place and going, I don't have a video for this one, sorry. Uh, and they start the project by stepping into a theater place, for example, where they, or a museum where they're going to present this work, and they go with time to discover objects that are hidden or people that work for that institution and that have a story to tell or that not necessarily come on stage often. And then with that, they construct the base, as you can see here, like a patchwork of objects that, are, that become like a patchwork on top of which uh, the audience, we all, they as uh, performers, as, as other bodies on the stage, will start this, uh, yeah, this, this, this other world as well, where there, this hierarchy is made to disappear. So where the story of the artist is certainly not the one that is being told. The artist is much more someone that builds a dispositive for other stories to appear. And then not only human stories, but also stories that are in objects, that are, uh, yeah, that happen in the moment. So this is another perspective. Eh? So there's not an artist with a vision uh, that wants to tell us something or made us reflect upon something specifically, but more a creation of a dispositive, of a setup, of a place, of a new place where we can reflect on our own position in relation to those objects, to the stories that are being told, and where the vision of the artist tends to disappear a lot because anthropocentrism, because it's not about me anymore and what I have to tell. It's much more about all of us relating with each other and with everything that's around us in a different way. And that happens with our bodies, with the bodies of the audience. So it has also a very dense quality to it, if we understand dance as this uh, connecting of bodies, as this uh, potential of uh, meaning and future meanings of other meanings being uh, put on display. More or less, yes. I'm improvising as I go, yes. If it's not clear, if you say, mm, I lost you, also. But they do this in classical theater spaces, or do they also? Both. Both. They uh, did this in the CCCB, that's a center for uh, contemporary culture, more an installation, uh, installation place, a museum space. Yeah. But they also did it in the Theater of Olot, they will do it in the theater as well in uh, Terrasse in October. And then, uh, yeah, that also makes, changes also the stories that are being told. There's also something interested, interesting about this, and that relates to another broader shared question 
That is, what are we doing theater or dance for? And this idea of sustainability, we have come accustomed in the cultural market to produce a work for theater space, let's say, and then you tour it. And you go to a place, you present it, you leave. So you leave no trace, no actual trace or no actual connection beyond that event that you can think, oh yes, I, have le I left the mark in one person of the audience, then I did what I had to do. But uh, these artists, there are many artists that also want to uh, build up more meaningful connections to a place uh, and be gone with this very neoliberal and uh, uh, consumable artistic work that exists by the grace of uh, funding that you receive. You make a work, you tour it one time, ten times, who cares? And then it disappears and you start the cycle again. That's something that we, that in the art world has become normal practice. But there are a lot of artists that try to think about that in another way and try to uh, make art emerge from more meaningful connections to a place. So in this case, they really want to get to know the place before something appears from it and carry the history of the place with them in that thing that emerges. I think that relates a lot, correct me if I'm wrong, also with how Kim uh, relates to places to make this more meaningful connections. I actually wanted to talk about you, but I thought, well, you're here, so what am I going to say? Uh, but I think that this is also something that uh, you can uh, also add anything if you want uh, at any time. <laughs> At any time, <laughs> when you want. <coughs> um, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this, this, this general uh, question in, in, with other examples as well. But now I want to go off to, I have a timer set, and it's going to go off in seven minutes. OK, so just a little bit more, and then we'll do the break. This gives me a moment to still introduce this second kind of knot or act of knitting loosely that I wanted to make uh, between different uh, projects. That is this idea of changing the story or who is telling it. I already said it at one point. This is also something that is shared in different contexts, this urgency to be aware of perspectives, stories, the invisibility of uh, certain bodies on the Western stages for very long and how to overcome that, how to uh, see these other bodies that are part of our uh, reality or hear about these stories that are part of our reality on stage through dance. Um, uh, yeah, from this urgency also many artists are making work and I wanted to present a couple of them. The first one is uh, Edurna Ruby Web para. This example, I was uh, wondering where, where to put it. I put it here because uh, uh, Edurna Rubio and Maria Pagès, uh, in her, their last project, which was called Anublo, they also work with this idea of anthropocentrism, this idea of overcoming. Uh, the centrality of our perspective. But they do so in, not like Nyam Nyam, what I spoke about right now, but really, again, in a conventional theatrical setting. But this, the change of the story here and who tells the story is uh, related to climate change and to this uh, thinking of nature as being, as an actor on stage, as a performer. And they do this very interesting project that is called Anublo, where they went to observe natural processes. And they, using the theater uh, technical possibilities, so which is very man-made, eh? all the lights, smoke machines, uh, making of sounds, everything is mechanical, so very man-made. But they put it in service of uh, tempos of developments of accidents that you would usually find in nature. It's not that they try to emulate nature. They try to really become it. 
that's very paradoxical because they do it with human things. Yeah? But then in, on stage, you don't see human bodies, but you see nature telling itself. Or, yeah, so you see the fog, you see uh, the, the end of a day, you feel the heat. There is a, they use all the elements that are there to allow for another storyteller to appear on stage, one that is not human. That's why I put it uh, in this. really frustrating and unexpected. So you see it's theater without actors in a way. Yeah? The body, even the body disappears, but it's still, uh, in many ways, it's dense what you see. You're really sucked into a movement of uh, phenomena uh, that not only emulate, but really become an, a natural, a dramaturgy of natural, uh, uh, wishful uh, natural elements uh, on stage. Yeah? That's a very different way than uh, symbolize it. Uh, nothing of what I'm saying overall is new. Eh? There's a, a long tradition of theater without actors, of how to make disappear the body, how to make the voice of the author disappear. That's something that already was taught a lot about in the 1960s. Eh? But the, the questions remain and are being challenged by different people with different strategies all the time. Uh, so it's not that I'm saying that any of these artists are in inventing the wheel, just that these are questions that are alive on the stages uh, today in my experience. Is this interesting for you so far? Is this, I'm really... Okay. Um, then, going back to the uh, questions where we are now, this idea of changing the story or who is telling it, I also was talking about uh, yeah, the stories that, yes? Is it Eduna Rubio Maria Perez or is Eduna Rubio Maria Perez? Oh, gosh. It's Jerez. It's Jerez. Did I put Pagès? I put Pagès. I said Pagès. Just to say. <laughs> it's Maria Jerez. But it's a different It's a different artist. <laughs> Very different, actually. Yes, Maria Jerez is a visual artist from uh, Madrid. And I did a, a mistake here. Yes. Uh, Jerez, that's uh, Jota. <laughs> it's written in the text, I think. Here you have it. And I will change this into this way. Look, I can do it right now. No, no, not at all. Look, that's my timer. I will fix this while you are on a break. Uh, let's uh, give ourselves five minutes, just go have a walk, uh, pee, and come back. Yeah? Um, OK, I was saying the second shared question was this uh, changing the story or who is telling it. 
uh, we are back into a very conventional understanding of the stage, yeah? people telling stories or having, in the case of Edurne and uh, Maria, uh, having machines tell the story, let's say. Um, now the next example of Dalton Janssen, who is a choreographer from uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, is again uh, yeah, from a sense of urgency, from a sense of need of uh, telling uh, his own story. We come back to really an artist having a vision and a need, someone wanting to, te to tell something that is often, in the case of many artists, also uh, very individual. So there is a comeback of this uh, individual voice of an artist with a message, with an intention, with a, a political, personal, uh, subjective intent of presenting him, her, themselves on stage um, uh, with that story, with that body, with the legacy that it carries uh, be, uh, behind. You see, that that's really a shift because we come from uh, ages in the Western tradition of contemporary performance, post-dramatic, post-modern, etc., etc., where it was all about, no, I am withdrawing myself. I am giving you the agency to tell me what this is about or how to build up meaning. And now we find a lot of artists, choreographers, etc., that say, uh, I don't have time for that. I want the story to be told. I want my body to be seen. I want this to be addressed. So there is much more um, this desire to represent something and without that necessarily meaning that a performance is again a dramatic uh, ballet with a narrative structure from A to Z. But yes, that there is a clearer metaphor, symbolic uh, frame, uh, references, etc. And that that's OK in the day that we live in. Because again, I don't have time for this. I have something to say. Yeah, there is a, a lot of this also going on. Uh, Dalton Janssen, for me, is a, a, a very good example of that. He makes, uh, he's very polyedric. He's, he's not just a choreographer. He has also started an agency now to help uh, young makers to uh, face the processes of funding in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, he makes a lot of work for uh, children, pedagogical works, uh, where he speaks of his own or where he in, is inspired by his own autobiographic uh, experiences at home and in uh, youth institutions um, uh, for uh, youngsters with social disadvantages, etc. Tell me. Oh, yes, that's uh, maybe a translation fault, and that comes from the Netherlands, uh, where you speak of educative voorstellingen, uh, educational uh, shows, as if, as if they were to, to be something else, as if not all the works are educational in a way. Uh, so maybe I just use that word as a translation of that concept that is very established in the Netherlands, but I didn't really mean anything by it. I mean, they are uh, works that are thought of to be shared or seen by uh, youth. Um, and then if they, those works are different or not from works that are seen by adults, depends on the choreographer, really. Um, I saw another. Yeah, I was just wondering if, if like, do they then have like, discussions after, if it's like, considered uh, that depends, really. The platform docs with which uh, Dalton works, and I'm not an expert, and so I don't dare to say if they have a lot of uh, projects surrounding the performance. I can imagine they do. Uh, in the system specifically of the Netherlands, and if people that work and live in the Netherlands like me can help me out, Alex, I'm looking at you, or you have more information about this, do let me know. Sorry? I just don't know the difference. Okay, okay. <laughs> just. Uh, actually, um, I imagine we have the same, like, educative voice-telling, we also have it. It's mostly, like, uh, that you go also with your school there. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when I experience it, it was theater dance, but then there's, like, conversations after, or, like, a little small workshop mm -hmm. connected to it to also get students 
more connected to art. Yeah. Exactly. That is something that I think is shared in both the Dutch and the Belgian yeah. system. There's also a specific line of funding for yeah. these kind of performances. So that's also why there's this specification, let's say, because you can apply for specific funding for those kind of... Uh, but I have to say, in terms of uh, making, me, myself, I position myself against the idea of a educative forestelling being something else than a forestelling. Uh, or to uh, infantilize too much, yeah? to address the, the audience uh, under 12, for example, uh, as incapable of grasping or making something of a choreographic performance, uh, whatever it is. Uh, but that's my, that's, yeah, we could, we could go into that conversation. And, and you know the name of the agency that you create? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, yes, I do. And I will write it down on the sway. Because now I will have to look at it on Instagram where I follow it. Uh, but it's called, I think, Blackbirds as his company. And then the agency carries this, the, of the dance agent slash Blackbirds. And I will put it uh, in it. OK? Uh, so I can now move on because I don't have a lot of time. Mohamed Tukabri is a little bit uh, a similar uh, story, but of course different in how he approaches or makes work. He's a choreographer, uh, born and raised in Tunisia, but already living in Belgium for a long while. He recently got his Belgian nationality, and actually in his last performance, The Power of the Fragile, um, he uses the opportunity that having the Belgian nationality offers him to do something that his mother always had wanted, that is to be on stage. But in the process of this, yeah, because at the moment that he had the Belgian nationality, in theory, it would have been easier for his mother to travel from Tunisia to Belgium to see him and to make this work together. But then, during the process of this idea, uh, what happened was that the visa of his mother was denied. Even though she had all the paperwork done, it was in the middle of Corona times. But they were faced with this very big frontier of something that would not have happened if he would have done that work with me. Uh, for me, crossing the border would have been easy. For his mother, it was still a very difficult uh, process. And that traumatic experience in the creative process also changed the project as a whole. Uh, so again, we see here the need and the urgency to tell a specific story, to show those bodies, and to have that contact between mother and son also tell us something uh, else, also uh, emits a radiation of energy that speaks of a distance that existed for 12 years uh, for a long time. Eh? In, while he did not have the passport, he could not be in Tunisia too long. It was only bound to specific dates. His mother was not able to uh, travel to see him. While in the performance, there's also a lot of storytelling by the mother of Mohammed, telling of how in the 70s, when she was younger, and the policies of frontiers and barriers were different, she was able to travel easily to Italy to spend 10 years working there with her body and herself and contribute to the Italian economy uh, before she moved back to Tunisia. And then the policies changed and the borders became uh, thicker. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, political implications in those bodies being on stage, in those personal stories being told, in how they are being told, in the fact that they are touching each other, and the fact that we know that they weren't able to do that for a long time. So it all becomes a universe. And that's why I put it here in this. Uh, yeah, these different stories being told on the Western stages by different bodies that are not often seen, etc., etc. There's also this sense of uh, urgency in uh, that. Uh, I need to move on. So I won't speak about this. I have chosen to uh, 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 speak of bodies specifically in the cater of this idea of a more inclusive uh, stage 
context in uh, Europe to say now this uh, broad uh, word, making use of uh, two choreographers, in this case, black or brown choreographers, and bodies, therefore, that come, that also have a relationship to the color of their skin, and that their identity is uh, infused by that, uh, determined by that. Uh, but of course, if we speak about diversity and inclusion, I could have also chosen artists that are now questioning uh, identity or uh, that are claiming for more inclusion and equality in terms of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and therefore, then I just wanted to put this link to the What You See Festival as an example of a festival in the Netherlands that specifically uh, curates work from artists uh, across borders that are questioning, reflecting, uh, telling their story uh, relating to uh, sexual diversity uh, and identity. Uh, because now I will not speak of those examples specifically. I w didn't want to not say anything at all. I think it falls under the same category. And you can check the website if you want uh, when you look into the presentation. But now I wanted to have time to also talk about another uh, changing of uh, stories of relate or different stories to be told or different ways of understanding our place in the world or connect to a sense of place in this case. Um, and again, eh, all the knots are connected because in the end what Dalton Johnson does is also to connect with his own heritage and the place where he grew up through his own story, through his own experiences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or Cherish Menzo, whom I spoke of in the beginning, who draws from a heritage of a peoples in a much broader sense that were moved across the world and trying to find that root in something uh, as abstract and as concrete as the bottom of the sea. Uh, I now want to talk about some examples in uh, specifically Catalonia or Spain that try to reroute in this very global world that is becoming so big, that, is, that has so many challenges that are sometimes overpowering us in a way of trying to go back to a certain root, to a certain origin, to a certain uh, yeah, locality as well, to put in value the importance of the local, of the small, of the community, of the place where you come from or where you are, uh, and from there ask bigger questions or uh, relate to the present in another way. That's why I uh, named it connecting with a sense of place through the traditional dance forms with the example of Laia Sakt Santanac to start with. Let's see a video if it works. In uh, AER, uh, this is an example that I uh, selected also to talk about uh, differences amongst contexts. I am talking mainly about the two contexts that I know uh, more. 
of course, any other context, Vienna is different. Uh, we were talking about that just now. But I just can talk about what I know. And it's nice to see also the different uh, interests or things that emerge differently in the Netherlands or Catalonia in this case. Because whereas, as I was saying, eh, Cherish Menzo or Dalton or this debate amongst the decolonization of history also of the Netherlands in terms of revisiting its own history as a colonialist uh, uh, power is something that is very present in the uh, debate around uh, national identity in the Netherlands. Uh, and even though it should also be the case in Spain, uh, we're not as much there yet, uh, although it is happening. What I mean to say with this is that the difference here is that in uh, Catalonia or in Spain, the uh, national identity through dance symbols, uh, dance languages, folkloric dance languages, <laughs> is much more present than in the Netherlands. Folklore, as such, is much more present and important in uh, countries such as Spain and its different regions, autonomies, uh, countries, etc., that live within it, than in the Netherlands. And here we see, therefore, a lot of choreographers that are also busy revisiting these dance forms to see how they can become relevant or how they can relate to those dance forms uh, from a contemporary present perspective with a body and an understanding of dance practice today. And reroute with that, but uh, changing it, modifying it, making it uh, actual uh, again. In the case of Aer, Vailaya Santanac, she takes a dance, a dance, a traditional Catalan dance called the Contrapas, which is a very simple, basic dance form that has a history that traces back to the Middle Ages, and with, an electro, uh, with a, a musician, a composer, uh, she worked together to, yeah, to rearrange it, to restudy it, to bring it back, to work from that rhythm, basically, and see how to connect with it uh, and make it relevant again. And that also carried a gender perspective with it, this idea of, OK, tradition, what is tradition? And how can we still relate to that tradition? Because contrapass, as happens with a lot of uh, middle-aged dance forms, uh, in certainly in Christian places, Catholic uh, Christian places, were only danced by men. And therefore, it's also criticizing by reappropriating those forms by a female body. Uh, on stage is also a statement, is also a, a relating to the old with the tools of today to, uh, eh, to, to relate to it for tomorrow. It's also a, a way to uh, yeah, choreograph based on that. More or less, these landed. Another example that is, uh, I mean, the most uh, known uh, folklore universe in Spain is flamenco, uh, I think. And uh, a name that's very important in that regard is Juan Carlos Lerida, uh, who is a choreographer that uh, also works to question and critically address what is flamenco. Anything that is traditional uh, suffers from uh, uh, a condemn, uh, is doomed by orthodoxy a lot. Eh? Those forms become fixed. They become bound to an, a certain ideology also, an, an identity. And in order to be part of that identity, they need to be a thing. So a lot of time, as happens with flamenco, happens with any uh, fol folkloristic dance form, is that they become like a code. You know, This is how you do it, and that's how you don't do it. This is good, and this is bad, and it needs to be preserved. In dance, that really doesn't work well, because dance happens and disappear, so you cannot expect to uh, it be the same as it was 300 years ago. It's already not by the fact that I am doing it today. Um, and there are many artists that try to uh, work with that, eh, to relate to it. In the case of flamenco, I could also name Israel Galvan. He's maybe a very famous choreographer that worked with that. Uh, but Juan Carlos Lerida is someone else that also, uh, hey, he also says it. 
uh, he wants to keep flamenco connected to the daily mundane street life with a project that is called uh, uh, the liturgy of the hours he also uses the catholic tradition in spain as a reference the 12 hours are also a reference to jesus christ and the way that he walked to being crucified and he makes therefore 12 different tableaus where he relates uh, with uh, regular day people of his environment to make different performances in a performance that lasts 12 hours and it's all carrying this past to the present to the street to different places to the stage and building a new story with it yes? also stating politically i am owning those forms that come from my past that are my heritage but i am doing something uh, with it that has value today uh, different value than only being a fixed symbol a monument of something uh, that is much more distant how do i personally relate with that heritage the place where i am the materials that are uh, around me etc and the last example that i wanted to uh, say in this show in this regard uh, which is quite different and a different understanding that I think is very interesting is this project called El Movimiento, the movement, by two uh, very uh, post dramatic, uh, nowadays contemporary, I hate that word, but uh, meaning not conventional, let's say, not stage practice. I'm showing you a metaphor of something and you watch. Um, which is uh, by Monde Dutor. Uh, and El Movimiento, for them, I will tell what the project is. They go to a place and they uh, work with uh, a community of people. And they are with them uh, and they offer their experience as makers, as experts in making things in creating in artistic processes, let's call it, uh, to facilitate, not even guide, but facilitate that community in finding their own movement. You know, to come up with a movement, with a dance form, with a dance form. And then they call that, this is folklore. This is our folklore. This is our movement. You know, folkloric traditional dance form are always coming from the popular, the people. It's dances that used to exist on the street, that were part of the community, that emerged and were needed also in a ritualistic level for the community. Dance used to be something that uh, made our bonds in a social environment stronger. Before it jumped on the stage, it was all about strengthening social cohesion within a community. It meant something to the people, not as something that you were looking at, but as something that you did together. And then those dance forms, like the contrapas happened, and then they became a symbol, and then we carried them as a traditional dance form. They are thinking, what is the popular movement of a given community today? And it is very layered because they work really specifically, for example, with people that live in a neighborhood in Barcelona that is attacked by a lot of, uh, yeah, where there's a lot of poverty or there's a lot of social challenges, et cetera, et cetera. And they want to make that visible by finding the movement of that people. Or they did it in a neighborhood in Madrid, uh, they told me. Uh, that, was, that had lost its identity as a village because it had been absorbed by the bigger city and then they were lacking institutions, funding, etc. And the neighborhood that used to be a village, uh, you know, with that project there was this intent of finding a new identity for that community in that neighborhood. Now they will work in uh, Terrassa with a group of uh, youngsters that are auto-organized uh, that have been given a space by the municipality to uh, organize themselves. It's a group of LGBTQ plus uh, youngsters uh, between the ages of 18 and 25, if I'm correct. And they will accompany them in finding their movement. And then 
the political also claim of it is that when that movement is found, they go to the municipality and they say, OK, this we want to register as uh, patrimonio, as part of the uh, heritage of the city. You know, the same thing you do with a dance form or a flag or a symbol, that it becomes immaterial heritage of that town. This is the popular dance of this moment, of this community, of this collective today. So again, eh, we see different strategies. Some are on stage happening, conventional, we look at it, etc. And then we have other artists that are busy with using artistic processes to not uh, impose a message or a vision, but have something emerge uh, to put that artistic practice in service of the community they visit. So again, it also speaks of sustainability. How do I make my artistic pra practice sustainable? How do I uh, give this to the people so that it has an, a more lasting effect on them than, than, than just being the spectators of a show that I come, I do it, and I go away again? Yes. Those are questions that are also in the background. Uh, and that I feel that are very much in the background. I come in these conversations a lot in the Spanish context, for example, where there's also a, uh, a problem that is called in the newspapers La España Vaciada, uh, that a lot of communities are being emptied out, a lot of space is becoming deserted, and everyone is traveling to the bigger cities. So the sense of building communities and sense of space and connecting to each other in a changing uh, state and not disappear, being absorbed by bigger uh, tendencies that's very much alive to, to, to connect the artistic practice, not only to abstract idea or concept or et cetera, but make it more, uh, relates it to the ground uh, with a stronger knot or tie. Tell me. Um, I know that I know that the the they document it a lot. They have this is still something that is in process of. It's a project that they started a while ago, but they've done it three times, and the idea is to continue growing also with the process. Uh, so it depends a little bit on on every case how much they achieved. Also, yeah, there is the intent, and then there's what you actually can achieve to do. In Sevilla, I know that they managed to actually have it registered as heritage. And then it is indeed the question of how do you pass this on? How long does it live? Uh, does it stay there? Is it being represented again? I don't know for sure. And we are very early in the project to see if. But they, what, they, what I do know is that they really give the responsibility of that to the people. So it's not that Monde du Tor is going to check with them next year to see if they do or do not something with it. If they open this door, they generate the possibility for this to happen. But then it really is also the community that will or will not uh, do something with it uh, in the future. It is their movement in the end. You know? no. um, I have five minutes. Someone. May I also ask a question? Of course. Uh, first, maybe uh, a, a short statement. I think even though uh, you you say like you're just concentrating on a few artists in in Spain and in the Netherlands, I feel like what you're describing is, is several tendencies we nowadays have in many countries uh, how to to understand an artistic work in a different way. So it's not mm -hmm. the proposition of an artist or a group of artists anymore to, to an audience and not uh, shifting the relation uh, between uh, the artistic work and the spectator. I think that has been reflected in the, the recent past a lot. And uh, I really uh, very much appreciate your observations about these different agencies that are there. Mm -hmm. But now I would like to ask a question. Uh, I'm just asking for a friend. Uh, <laughs> no, just, uh, 
in Asian, <laughs> I'm now a dance student. I learned all these kind of dance technologies from different parts of the history. I learned a lot about different artistic conceptions. And now I hear that, well, I let the, art, let the object speak for myself. We are not anthropocentristic anymore. I'm possibly not having a, 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 a body that is coming from a certain geographic, political uh, background. Um, so where, where do I find my place in this? Well, uh, where is my place in this artistic practice? Where uh, I would say uh, um, I, I would become more like a, a movement facilitator rather than a mover. For, for who is that question? Uh, for a friend. For a friend. No, but I mean, are you asking me? <laughs> it's actually for all, all of us. I think it's a very good question to leave there. And it's, uh, it's, not up to, it's not to me to, to decide. I think this, this speaks of, uh, uh, yeah, of, of each and everyone's own positionality. How do I position myself as a maker in this world? And there are makers that choose to, uh, or that really believe that they need to withdraw from the equation, or that they have to become, that they, they don't want to uh, be in the center. That's an option. We have seen some of the project that, that, of course, you don't disappear. Of course, everything is representation. But you use your knowledge and your heritage and your practice um, to, yes, facilitate or open up or uh, be present in a different way. Your movement will, it doesn't mean maybe that you need to disappear from stage or your body or your movement needs to disappear from stage. But it maybe will change if you understand it uh, connecting with the world around you uh, on equal level. It's also a way to come up with new choreographic material if you understand it and define it or explore it, um, trying to overcome the human-centered uh, perspective with <clears> this uh, other ways of thinking. I am thinking of an example. I didn't bring them to me, but there are choreographers that are researching a lot on the world of fungi, mushrooms. Fungi, which are microorganisms that uh, exist in non hierarchical fashion, that relate to each other, that grow differently than humans do, and where a lot of, of artists are finding inspiration to imagine new futures uh, and ways mm -hmm. of becoming, because we can maybe learn from other systems that exist in nature. The, root, the trees that feed each other from the tree. You know, you can find not only inspiration in nature, but also different ways of relating. And then does, yeah, I'm not the one to answer the question, but um, as we see others do not disappear from the stage at all. Uh, Can I add something? Because I think yeah. I would, maybe I would interrogate your friend um, and ask why that, like there's, this, there's a, a feeling of loss in that question, right? Or there's something that will be lost that will not be possible anymore because things are shifting. And I think what is really uh, so beautifully liberating is that because dancers have a, a tendency to observe their habits and therefore also their inhabitation in the world, and because the contemporary world needs to shift its inhabitation, there is also a position of arguing that dancers can take an even bigger role or more important role mm. in the politics, in the community making, in the all different kind like education and pedagogy than we've ever done before. So there's also a sensation of like. Maybe we're moving towards more abundance and actually reliance on the kind of knowledge that we build in the dance studio, exactly because we know how our body rests in space and because we're not one body but multiple different bodies. So maybe you should ask your friend why they, uh, why they're uh, looking at this as a. Uh, not that I'm saying that there's anxiety in it, but there is this melancholy somehow. Like, what will we now do now that we cannot just show up and do a choreography like we used to? Because maybe that's exactly the point that we shouldn't do it as we used to do it. Mm. And we are the ones that can find ways we don't use to do it. Mm. Maybe my, my friend that I asked for <laughs> just <laughs> asked me to ask that question yeah. because he wanted to generate such answers. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, what a manipulative friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love stuff. it. I have literally two seconds before my timer, so I will uh, leave it here. Hmm. 
but great. No, great. No? Okay. Uh, no, I like because I. So okay. No, I was thinking I still have other examples, but I will. They are there. Show them. We will. I mean, look at them uh, at your own leisure and pleasure. Uh, and maybe as an ending, I, I was reflecting on what has been said in the end. I teach dance history, and there is also something that I reflect upon a lot that connects with what Alex was saying, that dance has also been always the most invisible of all the arts, because it was uh, uh, in this very dualistic Western tradition that, believes, uh, for, that believed in God and then uh, went to believe in science, but always put limits to the body and its passions and its ability to be non-hierarchical, chaotic, uh, connect with a more continuous stream of existence and not only be part of the discontinuous, uh, man-made, uh, imaginary structure that we built for ourselves as the real, um, has always been the last sister of the arts because of it. It has been punished by it as an art form. And I would agree that actually in nowadays debates, it's the art form that is maybe best uh, prepared and suited to, uh, yeah, to tap into those discourses, not anymore from a place of only rational or uh, political message or statement or blah, 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 but in more also moving flexible, fluid uh, uh, ways and entry points. No. <laughs> okay, this was it for today. Thank you very much for your attention.